what does it mean to be human? And all this term, we've been focusing largely, not exclusively, on how, when and why we became what we call modern humans. In other words, these creatures, kind of apes really, but very unusual creatures that have language, so we can share our dreams, um, we have special eyes, we can look into each other's eyes. Most non-human primates have eyes which are designed to be opaque, like mobsters wearing sunglasses. They don't really want to be mind read. Um, and we have these, a whole number of, of very, very strange features for any animal. And, and of course among those features are uh, myths and, 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 and symbolic rituals. Um, so we're interested in what, it, what happened when we became human, what, ha what, what amazing events drove us across the threshold uh, from non-symbolic behaviour and communication to symbolic culture. And um, one of the avenues, one of the ways, one of the windows if you like into other minds, other times and places is uh, mythology. And you might be wondering why we're, we're telling a fairy tale. Um, the shoes that were danced to pieces from the, the, Gr the Br Grimm's Brothers collection um, this evening. Um, and uh, just very, very briefly, um, one of the major anthropologists of the last century was Claude Lévi-Strauss, who completely transformed the way we anthropologists look at myths. Before him, really, there wasn't much, you know, much in the way of any really useful theory. You had Sigmund Freud, you had Jung, but Lévi-Strauss completely changed everything. And I just really, really briefly, he proved in, a, in a, an immense four-volume work called Mythologique, looking at about a thousand myths of North and South America. Not everyone was convinced, but quite a few were, and I certainly was, proved um, that all the world's magical myths and fairy tales are variations on a theme. Um, and at the end of the day, you have, if you like, one myth ultimately. And when we look at a different, you know, when we look at, say, Jack and the Beanstalk or Sleeping Beauty or Cinderella, in a way they're, they're variations, versions of what ultimately at the root is, is one myth. Obviously the, the stories are different. So I suppose the idea is that the underlying grammar, the underlying structure, as the term David Strauss used, remains invariant. And it's the invariance of the underlying structure which makes possible the incredible variety of actual stories. It's a little bit like saying um, that on, on this amazing planet of ours, the only living planet as far as we know, um, in, in many ways the hardest component of the planet is um, the molecular structure of DNA. So all the rocks have gone under the earth, come out again, all the atmosphere has changed drastically, all sorts of things have happened, but one thing has remained invariant and that's the genetic alphabet with its four letters um, C, G, T, A, C, G, T, A that's remained constant and because it's remained constant it's enabled l all the different ver varieties of life um, to, to, f to flourish on this planet so the, the, the argument is that when I say that the underlying logic or structure or grammar of the world's myths is invariant, it doesn't mean the myths are the same, it means they're different, but they're, the, the, the thing which enables them to be different is this underlying, if you like, alphabet, underlying alphabet of, of mythology. I don't think levi strauss was all that convincing in clarifying what that ultimate logic really was. So when I was here doing my PhD many years ago in the um, 80s, I did a, a thesis on levi strauss's mythologique and um, I, I, I think I made it a lot easier to understand and a lot simpler. I'm not going to go through all the details of all that. But okay, um, at the end of the day with these stories, and they, they have to be magical stories, okay, there are all kinds of other versions of narrative. You can have historical narratives, you, you, you know, um, stories about this, that or the other hero, but levi is really dealing with magical myths and you might say what do I mean by magical? Well the core, the ultimate basic magical thing which happens um, concerns life and death. So, okay, the way I think of it is this. Um, the story begins with this world and in this world um, familiar things happen. 
Um, there's light, you can see people, you've got uh, older people, younger people, women, men, they have meals, they have sex, they, they might be married, but things happen which are like belong to the world of the living. And then in the story, uh, the Sleeping Beauty, Little Red Riding Hood, Jack and the Beanstalk, the story we're going to look at this evening. In the story, so, there's something happens, often a flow of blood, or something which is clearly symbolic of a flow of blood. And what then happens is you have this movement from the world of the living into the other world, into the world of the dead, the land of the dead. So you move from life to death, you die. And there's nothing much magical about that. You just, you know, you've moved from this world to the other world. And then comes the magic bit. You come back from the dead. So life, death, resurrection. That is the underlying logic of these stories. And when I was doing my research here, um, I worked out, at least to my own satisfaction, maybe not everyone's, that th these stories are quite accurate descriptions of what happens to people in real life as they become initiated. So in all hunter-gatherer societies, and our fairy tales from Europe are hunter-gatherer stories that are about the magic of the forest. You might have a miller, or you might have a farmer, but you'll, <laughs> you'll notice that the, the magic of the stories can, happens in the forest, and you have hunters and you have animals, and the all, the, all the magic of those stories are very, very familiar to hunter-gatherers. So um, what, 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 what happens in these stories is that you move from this world to the other world and you come back again. Um, and um, I, I, what I want to do this evening is to take one story and show you that it, it, it just makes beautiful sense. One of the things which Levi-Strauss taught us actually is to respect every detail of a story. They're, they're often a, a, a whole sequence of absurdities piled on absurdities, but there's a logic in those absurdities. Every detail is there for a reason. Quite often I'm looking at a story and I can't fathom what on earth that detail is there for, but, all, but at least since Levi-Strauss we've already, always known that if, if you can't work it out, it's your fault, it's not the myth's fault. There's a, there is a good reason why some apparently irrelevant detail is in a story, uh, and it's our job to search for that underlying intelligence not just dismiss the story as, as nonsense. Um, one other point I need to make before moving on is that um, insofar as the stories are, have kind of, kind of got a beginning, a middle and an end, they have a kind of a sequence and a conclusion. Um, they're stories about the origin of the rule of men. Um, so these stories seem to come from societies which have become, we might say, patriarchal, men basically rule the world. Um, but the stories allege that originally women rule the world. Um, and the stories are describing how some hero managed to steal power from women who once ruled the world, often allegedly in a tyrannical way, and how this hero made the world safe um, for marriage and the family. So they're, they're myths justifying the emergence of patriarchy. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read out one of those what are called primitive matriarchy myths. And I should again just introduce it by saying these aren't just strange, odd myths that I've happened to have selected. What happens is this, that in all parts of the world, and we're, we're talking not about cities and city-states, we're talking about hunter-gatherer cultures, or maybe hunter-gatherers who do a bit of gardening, horticultural societies. But that, that means a vast number of Amazonian, African, Australian Aboriginal, um, you know, Australasian uh, societies around the world. And in those societies, wherever men monopolize ritual power, those men will have a story that they stole that power from women. Um, and um, I'm going to read out one of those stories, which um, is from a a book by Maurice Cordelier, a, a French Marxist anthropologist, The Making of Great Men. It concerns the Baruya tribe of Papua New Guinea. It's quite a short story. Um, and it just gives you a flavor of, the, of these other stories. Um, in the days of the dream time, the women one day invented flutes. Now, you have to know that these flutes are 
supernaturally powerful noise-making instruments and whichever gender has the flutes has got the power so today among the Beruya the men during their secret male rituals they blow these flutes and to have the flutes is to have this ritual power we might call it magical power but, it, but in the days of the dream time the women invented the flutes <coughs> they played them and drew wonderful sounds from them the men listened and did not know what made the sounds one day a man hid to spy on the women and discovered what was making these melodious sounds he saw several women one of whom raised a piece of bamboo to her mouth and drew the sounds that the men had heard then the woman hid the bamboo beneath one of her skirts that she had hung in her house which was a menstrual hut the woman then left the man drew near slipped into the hut searched around found the flute and raised it to his lips he too brought forth the same sounds then he put it back and went to tell the other men what he had seen and done when the woman returned she took out her flute to play it but this time the sounds which she drew were ugly so she threw it away suspecting that the men must have touched it later the man came back found the flute and played it lovely sounds came forth just like the ones which the woman had made since then the flutes have been used to help boys grow and what you have to know is in this society and so many others for a man to go in to dare to go into the menstrual hut of women it requires extraordinary bravery extraordinary courage because menstrual blood is the most dangerous substance imaginable and it could wither you you can you can you can suddenly become old um, you can find that your penis doesn't work all sorts of terrible things can happen to you if you go anywhere near the menstrual house but this brave man managed to go into the menstrual house and seize the, the, the flutes from inside and take them back into this world hand them to men and ever since then men have been able to rule over women so this is Maurice Godeli the ethnographer his um, interpretation of the story the message of the myth is clear in the beginning women were superior to men but one of the men violating the fundamental taboo against ever penetrating into the menstrual hut or touching objects soiled with menstrual blood captured their power and brought it back to men who now use it to turn little boys into men that's the initiation rites but this power stolen from the women is the very one that their vagina contains the one given to them by their menstrual blood the old women know the rough outlines of this myth and relate it to young girls when they have their first period so the women kind of know the story um, but the story is now used by men um, and it, the, the, the whole story explains why it is now that, that boys get initiated in the way they do and then become a, a kind of allowed to use these flutes and, and well, I, I should just get to say a little bit more now in this society is in so many others when a boy comes of age he goes through an initiation ritual and the initiation is painful very often the boy is cut either his, his ears are cut or his, he, he's given a nosebleed or his arms are cut but he's got to bleed in many parts of Australia he has to bleed from the penis which gets cut and, and that blood is, is, is considered and described in all these societies as men's answer to menstrual blood it's like saying okay w women were able to bleed naturally and that and that gave them their magical power but we managed to steal the power from them and now we artificially cut our boys who kind of die but it's a temporary death and they come back from the from the dead in, into, you know, when, uh, when they emerge from the seclusion of, of initiation and so my argument is that uh, with this myth and so many others the stories which speak about going into the other world and dying and then coming back from the dead with with enormous power they're actually quite accurate descriptions of the experience of undergoing initiation so boys go on undergo initiation often girls do it as well of course but where these stories are prevalent when the men have taken over um, girls initiation is considered much more you know much lower down the scale much less powerful and sometimes actually not even allowed all to, you know not even allowed to happen altogether whereas men's initiation and including men's artificial um, bleeding or menstruation is is, is 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 the real power so that's one story I'm just read out as a as just to begin with as a sort of background before I get to the shoes that were danced to pieces and the next one I want to read out is um, is um, Cinderella 
Um, and that's because the, sto the story I want to get to eventually is the shoes that were danced to pieces and we have the symbol of the shoe as a very important part of the story. When I first came across Cinderella I didn't like it much because I knew it was something about a pumpkin and a bull and a midnight clock and things and I could and I, I was trying to make sense of these stories and link them together and, and with the Sleeping Beauty it was obvious where the blood was. The Sleeping Beauty she pricks her finger and bleeds and falls down dead and after a hundred years comes back to life again. And Little Red Riding Hood, she has a red hood, she gets eaten by a wolf, she goes into the belly of the wolf and then she gets rescued from the belly of the wolf. So those stories have plenty of blood in them. And I kind of didn't like Cinderella. I was giving a lecture in Rag many years ago, 35 years ago or something, and I just said, oh, I'm not, I don't know what to make of Cinderella, it's got no blood in it. And of course, at the back of the class, um, uh, Max Pearson, a student then, unfortunately he died a few years ago, he said, Chris, you, don't, you haven't even read the Crim's version. You know, he's, he was quite a, quite a sort of an assertive student and, and started arguing with his teacher and said, read the proper version. So I read the proper version and here it is. <laughs> Uh, I went, you know the whole, the, the, the story is the, the first part of the story is fine. You know, all, all know about the story. She's you know the, she's the sister that's um, she's like cooked, isn't she? She's in the, She's called Cinderella because she sleeps every night in the hearth with the, with the hot embers, and um, and her you know the ugly sisters uh, make fun of her. And when they get an invite to go to the ball, they go and they don't let her go. But then the fairy godmother gives her a pumpkin, which just turns into a carrot, and you know the story. I hope. Does everyone know the story more or less, please? Okay. And now, what happens when Cinderella has to rush off at midnight and go back home because otherwise she'll, you know, she'll turn to rags and it'll be an absolute disaster? What, hap what, what happens that enables the prince to think, okay, I, can, I think I can find this, this beautiful uh, maiden? There's the this, this is story of the slipper, isn't there? Okay. So now I'm just going to read out this part from the Brothers Grimm version. When evening came, Cinderella wished to leave, and the king's son was anxious to go with her. But she escaped from him so quickly that he could not follow her. The king's son, however, had employed a ruse, and had caused the whole staircase to be smeared with pitch, and there, when she ran down, had the maiden's left slipper remained stuck. The king's son picked it up, and it was small and dainty and all golden. Next morning he went with it to the father and said to him, No one shall be my wife but she whose foot this golden slipper fits. Then were the two sisters glad, for they had pretty feet. The eldest went with a shoe into her room and wanted to try it on, and her mother stood by, but she could not get her big toe into it, and the shoe was too small for her. Then her mother gave her a knife and said, Cut the toe off. When you're queen, you'll have no more need to go on foot. The maiden cut the toe off, forced the foot into the shoe, swallowed the pain, and went out to the king's son. Then he took her on his horse as his bride and rode away with her. They were obliged, however, to pass the grave. This is the grave of Cinderella's mother, where there's a tree has grown, um, a hazel tree, on which are two um, eloquent pigeons. Um, so they were obliged, however, to pass the grave, and there on the hazel tree sat the two pigeons who cried, Turn and peep, turn and peep, there's blood within the shoe. The shoe, it is too small for her. The true bride waits for you. Then he, this is the, the, the prince, he looked at her foot and saw how bl the blood was trickling from the shoe. He turned his horse round and took the false bride home again and said she was not the true one and that the other sister was to put the shoe on. I just want you to notice this. Um, these, these brides, the, you know, the ugly ones, as far as the prince is concerned, they're beautiful, they're lovely. The only problem is that they bleed from the shoe, okay? And that, that, that's the only sign of this apparent ugliness, um, that their shoe, that the, the blood um, flows from the shoe, otherwise you wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> then this one went into a chamber and got her toes safely into the shoe, but her heel was too large, so her mother gave her a knife and said, cut a bit off your heel, when you're queen you will have no more need to go on foot. That's of course because the queen gets carried around everywhere, isn't she? Uh, you know, she, she won't, need to, won't need to walk anywhere. So the maiden cut a bit off her heel, forced her foot into the shoe, swallowed the pain, and went out to the king's son. He took her on his horse as his bride and rode away with her. But when they passed by the hazel tree, the two little pigeons sat in it and cried, Turn and peep, turn and peep, there's blood within the shoe. The shoe it is too small for her. The true bride waits for you. He looked down at her foot and saw how the blood was running out of her shoe and how it had stained her white stocking quite red. Then he turned his horse and took the false bride home again. This also is not the right one, said he. Have you no other daughters? 
No, said the man, there's still a little stunted kitchen wench which my late wife left behind her, but she cannot possibly be the bride. The king's son said he was to send her up to him, but the mother answered, Oh no, she is much too dirty, she cannot show herself. But he absolutely insisted on it, on it and Cinderella had to be called. She first washed her hands and face clean, and then went and bowed down before the king's son, who gave her the golden shoe. Then she seated herself on a stool, drew her foot out of the heavy wooden shoe, and put it into the slipper, which fitted like a glove. And when she rose up and the king's son looked at her face, he recognised the beautiful maiden who had danced with him, and cried, That is the true bride! The stepmother and the two sisters were horrified and became pale with rage. He, however, took Cinderella on his, on his horse and rode away with her. As they passed by the hazel tree, the two white doves cried, Turn and peep, turn and peep, no blood is in the shoe. The shoe is not too small for her, the true bride rides with you. There's much you can say about the Cinderella story. I mean, one of the obvious things is that the, there's, the Cinderella has got no mother and no sisters. She's isolated and alone. Uh, and she's also kind of cooked because she lives in the, in the, in, in the hearth. Um, and the other two sisters, of course, have got each other and their mother. And they're certainly not cooked with all that blood. Um, and so the opposition is between women who have blood relations with each other and are not available as wives and on the other hand, womankind who is singular, isolated, uh, and doesn't bleed. And I was just mentioning, wasn't I, Ruth, earlier, that these stories are invariably patriarchal stories. Um, they're justifying male dominance in different ways, but they all have a kind of assumption that this transition to the rule of men is a historical event which needs to be explained and um, justified. So, okay. And now I'm going to read out tonight's story. Just to say, in the Radical Anthropology Group, over many years, I don't know what it is exactly, but there's been a kind of tradition which we have to have this story at Christmas. It's not a Christmas story, but this is the dark time of the year, and this story is about three dark nights. It's about the dark time of the month, three periods of monthly darkness, if you like, and you'll see what I mean. And I want, when I'm reading out the story, I want you to remember what I said about Livia Strauss, who tells us that these stories are variations on a theme. So one is a theme of women having power which is taken from them um, by some heroic man who's very, very brave. Um, and the other theme is, in this particular story is about the, um, the, the story of the shoe. And this, uh, and this is actually called The Shoes That Were Danced to Pieces. So. There was once upon a time a king who had twelve daughters, each one more beautiful than the other. They all slept together in one chamber, in which their beds stood side by side. And every night when they were in them, the king locked the door and bolted it. But in the morning when he unlocked the door, he saw that their shoes were worn out with dancing, and no one could find out how that had come to pass. Then the king caused it to be proclaimed that whosoever could discover where they danced at night should choose one of them for his wife and be king after his death, but that whosoever came forward and had not discovered it within three days and nights should have forfeited his life. It was not long before a king's son presented himself and offered to undertake the enterprise. He was well received and in the evening was led into a room adjoining the princess's sleeping chamber. His bed was placed there, and he was to observe where they went and danced. And in order that they might do nothing secretly, or go away to some other place, the door of their room was left open. But the eyelids of the prince grew heavy as lead, and he fell asleep, and when he awoke in the morning, all twelve had been to the dance, for their shoes were standing there with holes in the soles. On the second and third nights there was no difference, and then his head was struck off without mercy. Many others came after this and undertook the enterprise, but all forfeited their lives. Now it came to pass that a poor soldier who had a wound and could serve no longer found himself on the road to the town where the king lived. There he met an old woman who asked him where he was going. I hardly know myself answered he, and added in jest, I had half a mind to discover where the princesses danced their shoes into holes, and thus become king. 
That is not so difficult, said the old woman. You must not drink the wine which will be brought to you at night, and must pretend to be sound asleep. With that she gave him a little cloak and said, If you wear this, you will be invisible, and then you can steal after the twelve. When the soldier had received this good advice, he fell to in earnest, took heart, went to the king, and announced himself as a suitor. He was as well received as the others, and royal garments were put upon him. He was conducted that evening at bedtime into the antechamber, and as he was about to go to bed, the elders came and brought him a cup of wine. But he had tied a sponge under his chin, and let the wine run, run down into it without drinking a drop. Then he lay down, and when he had lain a while, he began to snore as if in the deepest sleep. The twelve princesses heard that and laughed, and the elders said he too might as well have saved his life. With that, they got up, opened wardrobes, presses, cupboards, and brought out pretty dresses, dressed themselves before the mirrors, sprang about, and rejoiced at the prospect of the dance. Only the youngest said, I know not how it is, you are very happy, but I feel very strange. Some misfortune is certainly about to befall us. You're a goose, you're always frightened, said the eldest. Have you forgotten how many king's sons have already come here in vain? I had hardly any need to give the soldier a sleeping draught. The booby wouldn't have awaken awakened anyway. When they were all ready, they looked carefully at the soldier. Billy had closed his eyes and did not move or stir, so they felt themselves safe enough. The eldest then went to her bed and tapped it, whereupon it immediately sank into the earth, and one after the other they descended through the opening, the eldest going first. The soldier, who had watched everything, tarried no longer, put on his little cloak, and went down last with the youngest. Halfway down the steps he just trod on a little on her dress. She was terrified at that and cried out, What is that? Who is pulling at my dress? Don't be so silly, said the eldest. You have caught it on a nail. Then they went all the way down, and when they were at the bottom, they were standing in a wonderfully pretty avenue of trees, all the leaves of which were of silver and shone and glistened. The soldier thought, I must carry a token away with me, and broke off a twig from one of them, on which the tree cracked with a loud report. The youngest cried out again, Something is wrong. Did he hear the crack? But the elder said, It is a gun fired for joy, because we have got rid of our prince so quickly. After that they came into an avenue where all the leaves were of gold, and lastly into a third where they were all of bright diamonds. He broke off a twig from each, which made such a crack each time that the youngest started back in terror, but the elder still maintained that they were gun salutes. They went on and came to a great lake whereon stood twelve little boats, and in every boat sat a handsome prince, all of whom were waiting for the twelve, and each took one of them with him, but the soldier seated himself by the youngest. Then her prince said, I wonder why the boat is so much heavier today. I shall have to row with all my strength if I am to get it across. What should cause that, said the youngest, but the warm weather. I feel very warm too. On the opposite side of the lake stood a splendid, brightly lit castle, from whence resounded the joyous music of trumpets and kettle drums. Notice the castle is brightly lit, um, so clearly this is in the night time. And so when we saw the leaves of silver and gold and diamonds, you, you need, to think of, need, need to think of the light of the night sky with these sparkling, um, uh, glittering objects up in diamonds, uh, up, in, up, in the sky, up in the sky. Um, they rode there, entered, and each prince danced with the girl he loved. But the soldier danced with them unseen, and when one of them had a cup of wine in her hand, he drank it up, so that the cup was empty when she carried it to her mouth. The youngest was alarmed at this, but the eldest always silenced her. So notice the wounded man refused to drink the wine up in this world, but down in the underworld, drinking wine is what you have to do. Um, and you need to work out what colour the colour the wine might have been. It doesn't quite say, but I think you can all probably um, probably guess what what colour the wine um, was. Um, the, sorry, they they rode there, entered, and each prince danced with the girl he loved. Okay, roll uh, over. They danced there till three o'clock in the morning, when all the shoes were danced into holes, and they were forced to leave off. The princes rode them back again over the lake, and this time the soldier seated himself by the eldest. On the shore they took leave of their princes and promised to return the following night. When they reached the stairs, the soldiers ran on in front and lay down in his bed, and when the twelve had come up slowly and wearily, he was already snoring so loudly that they could all hear him, and they said, So far as he is concerned, we are safe. They took off their beautiful dresses, laid them away, put the worn-out shoes under the bed, and lay down. Next morning the soldier was resolved not to speak, but to watch the wonderful goings-on, and again went with them a second and a third night. 
Then everything was just as it had been the first time, and each time they danced until their shoes were worn to pieces. But the third time he took a cup away with him as a token. Last little bit. When the hour had arrived for him to give his answer, he took the three twigs and the cup and went to the king. But the twelve stood behind the door and listened for what he was going to say. When the king put the question, where have my twelve daughters danced their shoes to pieces in the night? He answered, in an underground castle with twelve princes, and related how it had come to pass, and brought out the tokens. The king then summoned his daughters and asked them if the soldier had told the truth. And when they saw that they were betrayed and that falsehood would be of no avail, they were obliged to confess all. Thereupon the king asked which of them he would have to wife. He answered, I am no longer young, so give me the eldest. Then the wedding was celebrated on the self same day, and the kingdom was promised him after the king's death. But the princes were bewitched for as many days as they had danced nights with the twelve. Well, normally what we do at this stage is I get you into little workshop groups and you, just, you kind of decode the story, but maybe as there's not that many of us this evening, we can do it. Shall we do it together, all of us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, maybe a mysterious question is, who were the Twelve Sisters dancing with when they went into the underworld, across that lake, that warm lake, um, into the underground castle? Yes. So it's, some, it's quite a naughty thing. It's definitely naughty. So yeah. They're dancing with the devil, I suppose. <laughs> <in the metaphorical. laughs> Seems to be quite a lot of devils. But twelve, 12 yeah. sisters is a bit like the months of the year. Yes, indeed. That's right. There's, there's twelve. There's twelve sisters. Um, is it is it normal for a, a, a man, even a king, to have twelve daughters and that's it? So what else might he have had? This is the incestuous parable. Well done, Barrett. You've obviously been attending the Radical Anthropology course for, <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for a few weeks. So the, the, the mysterious thing is, where are the brothers? Yeah, it's a valid question, isn't it? I mean, you've got 12 daughters, and there don't seem to be any brothers. Um, now, we know that the princes that come along to inherit the kingdom and have their heads chopped off Presumably, they're not brothers. I mean, presumably, they're, they're uh, you know eligible suitors that the king would you know would like them to marry. And maybe I should ask at this point a, a question: Are these sisters keen on marriage? It seems to be the absolute worst disaster that can happen to a woman <laughs> is to end up married to one of those men. I mean, they rejoice every time one of these would-be husbands. Every time his head gets chopped off. Um, they seem to think it's great. Okay, so in anthropology we do kinship studies here as, as elsewhere, of course. And in kinship we make a distinction between well, kinship and marriage, or kin, 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 your kinsfolk and your affine. So people are, people of the opposite sex, put it simply, people of the opposite sex are divided into two categories: those you can marry who are eligible as marital partners, and those with whom it would be incest if you did marry them. So, you, and in a, what's called a classificatory kinship system, and nearly all hunter-gatherers have that, everyone's got dozens of brothers, and dozens of potential husbands, and every, you know, every, every, um, every, every man has got dozens of sisters, because you're, you, 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 we have what's called the equivalence of siblings. The, two sisters will say, my sister's child is my child. So what we would call parallel cousins, they call they, 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 they're, they're sisters and brothers. So anyway, in this story, we don't seem to have brothers. And yet, we have husbands and we have the daughters of the king, and they go down into the underworld and they have a wonderful time. And clearly that's not marital sex. They're having a great time in a different way. You know, I'm not saying they have sexual intercourse, but they're having a wonderful dance and a great time with these people in the underworld who we have to assume they're brothers because where else are the brothers? Okay, and it would make a lot of sense to assume that they're brothers because every uh, uh, one of the points which Claude Levi Strauss makes in his Mythologique, he makes this interesting point was that which is that incest is so 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 wrong, and yet in every one of the magical stories, this wrong thing is the most magical thing to do and it's a source of 
rain making magic and all kinds of other uh, potencies so marital sex doesn't really get you anywhere as far as shamanism or cosmic you know potency or you know is concerned it, you know people get married and they have sex and you know, babies turn up but but that's that's not magic so another thing is magic right um, in the story um, we have the the, 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 the the sisters who come back f from the dance with holes in the soles of their shoes um, uh, Okay, I, I, read, I read out to you Cinderella. Uh, Cinderella is just one of many stories which has this metaphor of the shoe. Um, and so, are you kind of with me here? What time of the month are those three visits to the underworld? What time of the month is, is it for, the, for those women? I mean, obviously there's a bit of guesswork here. It's not explicit, is it? But there, there's holes in the, sh in, the, in the soles of the shoes. Be brave. You're allowed to say slightly naughty things. The menstrual Why are you saying that? <laughs> well, because of um, the, the wine, maybe. Um, yeah. Being yeah, and because a, a, a shoe with a hole in is like a vagina with a hole in, so it's leaking. So, and that, I mean, and we had that in the Cinderella story. That, that's a very explicit version of this image of the shoe as a vagina symbol, mm -hmm. and a, and a. Uh, a shoe that's got a hole in it is like it's not containing any blood; it's it's letting it flow. So this is the this is the dark time of the month. But also, yeah. Also, it, what struck me immediately was the fact that there was no mother. Yeah. I mean, is that important? I'm sorry, I no, no, it, no, no, no. I I think it is extremely important. Because, because yeah, it's yeah. also similar to King Lear. In oh King yeah. King Lear. Yeah. There is no the mother. There's three daughters. You may remember. And one of them, the youngest, doesn't want to get married. The other two are married to sort of slightly dysfunctional or rather violent men, Cornwall and Northern. Oh, yeah. But yeah. the mother of, of those, those three um, girls is never mentioned throughout Prophet. And what it, when entering the wor this world, it feels unbalanced to me because of the absence of the mother. So you, I don't, I, I don't, and I don't really know why the mother is absent. It's, a, it's clearly a story about the origin of marriage under male rule, isn't it? I mean, the king l kind of legislates that these, his daughters will get m married. And is the incest already there in the locking up of the daughters by the father? Is it, is it implied that, that is his, they are his property in some kind of way? Yes, except of course they escape, don't they? I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they're absolutely rebellious. I mean, you said they're naughty. And, and, and what do you do with your 12 sisters to get into this naughty place under the underground? You all jump into bed together. So, I mean, I mean that, that just is in the story. It's, I'm not making it up. It's just, it is what happens. So the sisters jump into bed together. By being in bed together at the time of the month when you're menstruating, you find yourself in the underworld. And in the other world, you do have a lot of fun, but it's not marriage. And I'm just simply saying those princes must be their brothers. Yeah? I mean, you know, is, it, is that a bit shocking? Is anyone, I mean, you're allowed to be shocked. I mean, it's, it's Grimm's fairy tales are really, they're full of blood and gore. And they are, you know, they're not, not you know, they're not mummy and daddy, you know, helping, you know, <laughs> being home and shopping and all. And then, you know, then these aren't pretty stories. They're really ra <laughs> rather gruesome stories. Okay. Um, okay, now, um, wh what we know from anthropology is that um, in, the, in well, uh, menstruation is a very powerful event and very often with hunter-gatherers, and I'm now thinking of the, the Bambuti uh, hunter-gatherers of the uh, um, Ituri forest in, 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 um, in the, in the um, eastern Congo. Um, they have a ceremony called Elima. And the Alima is a ceremony of which g girls go through to celebrate the fact they've been blessed by the moon. And when um, Colin Turnbull, in the book, wonderful book called The Forest People, described this um, event, two girls had been blessed by the moon simultaneously. So two girls had come into, uh, had begun to menstruate um, simultaneously. It's clearly they're, they're synchronizing their periods, but just, just two of them. And they go into this hut 
and they it's very intimate they're with their mothers and sisters and they sing and sing and sing uh, and they're learning about boys and they're learning about you know how to become adult they get that's that's the whole point of, of initiation as well but the crucial thing I'm point I'm making is that they're in it's the dark time of the month ideally at any rate and they mustn't be they mustn't be in the light there mustn't be any sunshine uh, or moonshine and um, Right in this in this story, this, 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 the twelve daughters they go down through the bed. They pull a lever in the bed. It, it leads them down the stairs into this underworld. And down there, you're looking up at the sky. And what do they see when they look up? Remind me. Silver leaves, gold leaves, diamonds. So we have three three nights, um, three types of trees: silver, gold, diamond. And what do you really see if you go out of the night at dark moon when you look up at the sky? Stars. Stars, yeah. So it's sort of showing you that the stars are shining and there's no full moon, there's no moon and no sun. Um, and the, okay, now let's, let's go to the, 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 ac the actual narrative. The narrative is about a man who steals the power from the girls and enables the king to establish um, marriage. So the girls have been going once a month down to the underworld and coming back, coming back, coming back. Um, and they've felt safe up to now. Um, they give w wine. Uh, one would assume if it was done in the pantomime or in a film it would have to be red wine. It wouldn't, the whole thing wouldn't work very well with white wine, would it? I don't think. Um, and it's really important that the the, the man who's going to steal the secrets doesn't drink their, their wine. Now what is it about the man which makes him, makes him special, makes him different? Do you remember? There's a little detail about him. That's right. So, so he's somebody with a wound. He's a soldier who kind of died in the war but didn't quite die. Must have come back, you know, he must have survived the, you know, the, the wound. He also meets the mother who knows. And, and although your point, um, so although your point is, is a very good one about no mother, mm -hmm. there is this old lady. <laughs> um, but now she's, she's actually not on the side of, the, of, her, of her gender, is she? She's actually working for the enemy, if you like. She's actually helping this spy to go down into the other world invisibly, and she tells him not to drink the wine and to put on this invisible cloak. Um, but because he's wounded, can you see he's kind of immune to the blood in a way that other people might not be? Those other those, those princes who turn up, they have their heads chopped off, um, and of course there must be quite a bit of blood each time that happens. Um, but this guy has already been wounded, and having that wound, um, as, uh, and of course it's, as, in addition to that, having the having the blessing, the, you know, the um, the invisible cloak and the instructions from the old lady, the old witch, um, means that he can go into that dangerous place in the underworld and find. Um, treasures to take back again um, to give um, men the power. Now what does that remind you of in terms of the story of the the origin of the sacred flutes? Because I mean it is really the same story. I know it's the other side of the world and, you, and you, it's not very good to make links between one story in one part of the world and another story in the other world, but, but with the matriarchy myths the point about them is that they are they're remarkably uniform. I mean wherever in the world um, Men have a monopoly of ritual power. They have a story which explains how they've got that monopoly and how originally that power belonged to, to men. So do you remember the story of what happened? Where, where the, the women invented the flutes and where did, she keep, where did they keep the flutes? Up the, Up the skirt in the menstrual house. Now that is the most secret, sacred place a woman can possibly put anything valuable. But it's that that men need to steal. So somebody's going to be brave enough and immune enough to the terrible magic of menstrual blood to go into that space and steal that power. Now, another point to make is this, that um, and some of you might have been here last Tuesday when we were doing polyphonic singing, and Ingrid, who was leading the, the singing, just mentioned that for the forest people, the Bayaka that um, Jerome and Ingrid have been studying for many, many decades now, the time when you sing most um, all through the night, and when the women will say, if you ask them why are you singing, they say we're singing for our lives, it's dark moon. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is because in the course of human evolution, dark moon is the time when, in the past especially, 
we would have been most um, at risk of being attacked by predators. Um, so we evolved not in the forest actually, we evolved on sort of mixed savanna probably with lakesides and but, but quite a bit of open territory and certainly plenty of big cats around and those, uh, those, those lions have brilliant night vision and they prefer to hunt in the at, at dark moon and so we think that humans in that long period of two or three million years of hominin evolution would have gathered together for safety in numbers particularly around dark moon and in order to keep the lions away singing and the women actually say that to this day if you say why are you singing they say we're singing for our lives we're singing to keep the leopards away or the lions away i mean camilla did some work with the hadza a few years ago and we and i was there actually as well for the, what they call epame which is a dark moon ritual mm -hmm. these are hunter gatherers in tanzania <coughs> you still hunt with bows and arrows hunt large game animals the way we did for tens of thousands of years hundreds of thousands of years <coughs> and um so what happens with the polyphonic singing is it, it amplifies the effect of a group so you can have maybe five or six or ten women but it sounds like two or three times as many people the, the polyphonic singing magnifies this the impression of the of the numerical strength of the group so when the women say we're singing for our lives um, they mean it so you make a noise at dark moon because that's the time when you most need to be safe from the predators um, and Levi Strauss points out in his Mythologique that um, in many cases, uh, and probably particularly when men take over ritual power from women, they don't so much engage in the singing, but they found other ways of making a loud noise. So they have these um, bull roarers, for example, they're <coughs> instruments you whirl around your head on the end of a string, and woo, 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 makes a roaring sound. You have what's called trumpets, which hollow logs, you, you, know, you raspberry down them and make a, a thunderous sound. But noises at dark moon are what you expect. Full moon is, is different. Full moon is honeymoon. A full moon is for rejoicing, relaxing, love-making, romance, and you don't want horrible noises. And you don't, everyone won't be polyphonic singing. When you're polyphonic singing, nobody can be having sex because everyone has to be present for the singing and everyone can sort of hear everyone else. You can't sneak off somewhere because we're like, where are they gone? So that doesn't happen. But at full moon, it's completely different. So, and, and Levi Strauss has this term, he calls, them, he calls the noise-making instruments, the trumpets and the flutes, which are symbols of the male monopoly of power, he calls them instruments of darkness. And he even links it, by the way, to the hooting of foghorns and ship's horns at every, every year um, on New Year's Eve and many other rituals around the world where at the dark time of the year is the time to make noise, as also the dark time of the month is the time to make uh, noise. So what happens in the story, this story, remind me, when the wounded old soldier is down in the underworld and he's, pick, he's plucking uh, golden branches or silver branches or diamond branches from the sky to take up as trophies, what happens each time? There's a very loud noise, it sounds like you know, cannon, gun salutes. So again, dark moon, instruments of darkness, noises, and, they, and the, these, are the, the, these, these sounds, or the instruments that make the sounds, are uh, intimately associated with the power which, has, which can only be found in that underworld, uh, and, then, and then taken back into this world. Um, I've, I said earlier that the, 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 the Twelve Daughters don't seem to be very keen on marriage and this is one of the reasons I like this story is because in so many, in so many stories um, like The Sleeping Beauty for example what the, the ending is, okay, there's a lot of blood in the stories and a lot of intimacy with partners who are certainly not your, 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 your bride or, or bridegroom um, but they end up with O oh, and the two lovers meet each other and they get married and they all live happily ever after. Um, and this story is making it very clear that for as far as these 12 daughters are concerned, marriage is a punishment for being found out. Um, so, okay, so w the, the, the daughters are worried, they're listening at the door, they hear, they hear the, the, the man explain what happens, what they've been up to every night, and there's nothing they can do about it because the evidence is, is there. The, 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 the soldier's got the, the branches from the trees. Uh, with him to show to the king. Um, so there's nothing they can do and um, they, they've been found out and, they, and they're going to get married off and, um, and, the, and the, the, the soldier is asked which one will you take? Um, and he, t 
takes the eldest, doesn't he? Surprising. Because he's with the, younger, the youngest during the journey. And he suddenly says, I'm old, so I'll, I'll have the oldest one. Yes. The young one is the one who's curious, yeah. intelligent. Thank you. Insightful. But the older one, you don't hear from her. She's not really introduced. Well, she does. No, yeah, she's, she's the one that says it's all right. She's, she's the one that says. She's the one who keeps on, keeps, keeps on saying, "Oh, it's fine. Oh, it's such a silly goose, such a silly goose, and all that stuff." Oh, right, okay. now, that, that, now, as I mentioned before, these these stories are, in my view, um, descriptions of the actual, real experience of undergoing initiation, of going through a kind of death and then coming out the other side. Um, and for that reason, and certainly this is true of the European fairy tales, if there's, if there's a number of sisters or a number of sons, a number of, of siblings, uh, have you noticed in all of them, the, as, like what you're saying, the, the, the intelligent one, the, the one who's celebrated for being, for being quick-witted is always the youngest. And of course that would be because it's, these stories are about the youngest. I mean, the, the initiation happens when you're about 13 or 14. It wouldn't happen when you're 19 or 20. That's your audience, you mean. So, so the stories are boosting the, the, the intelligence and uh, heroism of the person going through initiation. So this, this girl is too quick and sharp and intelligent to get married off quickly. She's, she's the one who is the last to suffer the terrible punishment of undergoing marriage. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of making that up a bit. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, in the sense that I, if it had been the youngest, if he'd said, oh, I, I, I like a sexy young one, I don't want an old one, uh, we would have had to explain that detail. But, but these stories are definitely uh, um, descriptions of the experience of initiation. And, and it just so happens that in the Grimm stories and the, and the European fairy tales, you'll always find if it's three or four brothers, it's the youngest who, who looks like the least experience and the least skillful who turns out to beat everybody else and I think I, I, my own view is that's linked to the idea that initiation is happening to somebody at quite a young age uh, you, you you, know. Do you mean to say that because the person being initiated would likely be the same age as the youngest I'm saying exactly that, Therefore, sorry you want the person, you want the person <laughs> being initiated to relate to the That's right, the this is their story this is a story. Come a cropper that's right, this is their story, yeah. showing, showing how brave they are, uh, you know, to go through this... And this is what's, gonna ha what's happening to your older sister your, or whatever, Yes, I, something like that. I, your older sister is that, yeah. halfway yeah. towards the old lady, the mother. Yes, okay. Uh, there's a yes, the, a continue. yes, the old lady is... Okay, yes, okay, there's a, there's a continual degree of resistance to patriarchy or degree of resistance to marriage, and the older one is the most colluding with patriarchal marriage and the younger one is the most resistant to it she's the most alert yeah. and yeah which is why uh why the soldier wants her and not the young uh, the yes he wants somebody a bit more easy to, easy to get on with a bit yeah. more pliable yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it was the older sister who gave cover to even when the younger one was the youngest one was alert yeah 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 are there any, I mean, what I was saying earlier on is levi strauss teaches us to respect every detail as, as there for a reason. Um, and there must be quite a few other details I've, I haven't you know, picked out in, in this kind of you know, uh, feedback on the story. Um, there's the great lake around the castle, and it's a warm lake. I don't know. Um, I, I'm thinking of... They say the lake is the sex drive. Sorry? Psychotherapy, I've heard the lake described as um, a sex drive. The lake is a sex drive? Yeah. Well, ask someone to think of water. Yeah. Then that, that um, whether it's a sea or okay. a puddle, or uh, whether it's warm or cold, is kind of, you, you can argue. I, I, I would just ask you a, a really basic question. I don't think I've asked it in connection with this story before, but if this water or lake is uh, erotic attraction is it is it going to be cold or warm if it's warm it's because it's good isn't it and well if it's warm it's because for these women want to enter it yeah if it's cold it's because the woman would be nervous this is just me being insightful i don't know oh yeah be, I, I want you to be insightful it's great it's great when all of you are insight, insightful I'm, I'm trying to be insightful myself but didn't you say yeah. that the water was warm yes well, the daughter said she felt yeah. warm, and that was why the boat was hard to row. Yeah. So it doesn't. She didn't exactly say that the lake is warm. So there was something about the warm. No, uh, no, no. I think the lake is warm. That's, I think it. I think the lake is warm. Um. So that's <coughs> an excuse why she.
she imagines why why the prince has a has a hat. Oh, is no, actually, sorry, sorry, you're right, Anthony. Yes, it's the weather is warm, not the actual yes, lake. You're quite right. That makes, yeah. makes she gets warm, and the, the reason yeah. why she gets warm <coughs> is because the boat is heavier. Mm. Yes, because she's, she's having to... She's, they're rowing. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. She's, yeah. No, she's saying that the prince has got to row, and he's wondering why is it so heavy. She says it's because of the warm weather. Prince. But actually it's because there's an invisible man yes, weighing exactly. down the boat, isn't right. it? Exactly. So what's, what's mm. explain that? Mm. Sorry? Explain that then. I've got to explain that. Uh, yeah, no, no, fair enough. I mean, I, we, we should explain everything. Yes, um, I don't know. Um, mm. Okay, maybe go back to the. To the I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I mean the, 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 the main the main point to make, isn't it, all the way through with the, with the nail and all those other things? That there's, there's somebody there that no one can see, and so funny things happen, like the boat. You know, like you you, you suddenly catch your. Your, your dress on a you know a, a nail a pant you call the older sister but actually of course it's it's the it's the um the man coming down after them that treads on the on the skirt so all these funny things happen including why is this boat so you know so heavy why isn't it moving i mean that's the main point isn't it i don't i, I think the, the role of the youngest um, sister is ambiguous i mean on the one hand she's maybe considered or could be conceived to be the one that's most resistant to patriarchy but on the other hand, as we know, she is the embodiment of the initiate, yeah. of the person being initiated. Mm. And that heaviness mm. stands for that sense of, of readiness mm. and of, of sexual maturity. Mm. And I, I, I think that's, and, and her, her being warm is, is connected with that, yeah. In, yeah. In, in, yeah. In, in, yeah. I think. The bodily changes. Yeah, the bodily yeah. changes mm. of mm. the menstrual mm. movement, the first mm. menstrual mm. movement, mm. the heaviness of the breasts, the, mm. the mm. business of the change in the shape of the Okay, that's, that's uh, But why is that an effort for the brothers? So you could also it's say... It's not an effort for the brother. Why do you keep saying it's... Because so the it's brother's doing the rowing, so... Who is, no, he's not. No, he's not. It's the... It's they get, they, it's the, it's no, 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 Anthony's right. Then her prince said, I wonder why the boat is so much heavier today. Says, why, why oh, I shall have to row with all my strength if I'm to get it across. Oh, right, yeah. so why, why could the girl... Um, so, for the brother, the girl seems heavy because he doesn't see the hidden man. And the girl, you know, if she's the, the initiate, she's the furthest away mm -hmm. from the girl, which is, mm. is the initiation. So maybe that. So we have this. We have these loud gun salutes, which are really the branches making a huge noise, and then they went on. I'll just read this bit out again, and came to a great lake whereon stood twelve little boats, and in every boat sat a handsome prince, all of whom were waiting for the twelve, and each took one of them with him. But the soldier seated himself by the youngest. Then her prince said, "I wonder why the boat is so much heavier, t heavier today. I shall have to row with all my strength if I am to get it across. Why should, what should cause that?" said the youngest. "But the warm weather. I feel very warm too." And then they go to they, they go to the castle, and it's brightly lit, and there's the joyous music of trumpets and uh, kettle drums. Getting across the lake yeah. is, is another iteration of the jumping into bed, going. Yes, it is. It, it is that. Yeah. So there's yeah. a trans. Mm, yeah. Transition yeah. I, I, I like the idea that it's another iteration yeah. of jumping into bed. When you look up from yeah. the, mm. this kind of shaft that appears yeah. where the bed was, yeah. up, there's no movement from the other side of the lake. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's yeah. There? Yeah. Yeah. None other than the moon mm. itself. Mm. 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 I thought that the um, older sister is showing less objections because she wants to be complicit. Well, that's the point we made about a sort of continuum, isn't it? As the older you get, the more you're willing to sort of. Yeah, knuckle yeah, under and yeah. find, oh, okay, I've got, I've got to get married sometime or other, yeah, yeah, yeah that's something like that. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of an obvious thing, which is that, you know, t today in our culture, I mean, you know, what happens to girls for about 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, Friday nights, all going out of the gaggle together, all putting up each other's makeup, all having a great time, all you know, laughing about which boys they're going to be with, going on the hunt for boys. <laughs> And then what happens? Uh, it's just, I mean, I, I've got you know, two daughters, and it's just, in a way, it's just so sad, you know. Oh, we've lost her, you know, whoever it is. Anne, oh, you know, oh, well, we've lost her now, because she's, she's gone off with a regular boyfriend. So gradually what happens is that the girls who love to be together, ha having their solidarity, they all get taken away, taken away, taken away, until everyone's isolated with a husband. Mm -hmm. And all that, all that teenage solidarity that girls have such a wonderful time with gets broken and lost. And this story is kind of, sort of about that, isn't it, as well? 
from the brother's point of view. You lose and, of and of course, you're, uh, and a very important point as well. That br br as brothers, we lose our sisters. So they go off with some other wretched guy, you know, and that's the end of that. You know, he's got her now. So if you did have lovely solidarity with your sister or sisters, you're going to lose it. And, um, and under patriarchy, we just have that, that idea, don't we, that love to be real love. It can't be with your, you know, it can't be with neighbours, can't be with friends, can't be even be with the family really. The real love is this thing which happens when you fall in love with a you know, person of the opposite sex and you, you know, that's real love. Everything else is sort of secondary. Um, and it just, it's, I'm, I'm not saying it's not lovely to have that and all of us in different ways we've, we've you know, felt hugely relieved in finding a partner, same sex, different sex, whatever, but to have one person that you really get on with is a wonderful relief. But on the other hand, it does mean, of course, does that, that you lose that. Happen, Sorry? Does that actually happen? I'm, I'm told it does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told it does happen that you, you find somebody who's the all, who represents everything for you and you fall in love and then you're happy That's for life. The sisters are told. And yeah. I did an experiment when I, when I bought dildos for my sister. You they bought did. dildos for your sister? Yeah, Anthony, yeah. that's terrible. And they, they, just, they, were, they didn't like it. <laughs> I'm not surprised <laughs> they didn't like it. They stage married sisters. So <laughs> this was really a transgression. Well, I'm very much so, Anthony. I could have told you that. It's very well meant, you know, in a brotherly way. Um, <laughs> 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 I, it was interesting because yeah. the reaction was one you would predict. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, absolutely so. There's a story in of itself with the youngest sister. Yeah. There's an intuitiveness in youth that when we get older, we try to drown down um, the She picks up on very slight things. Yeah. Her older sister, when we get older, we try to kind of sort of mash out or, 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 or level out with young yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. But it's sort of drowned out her thoughts and ideas are drowned. I yeah. can see that, that that happens in society, you know, the kind of time yeah. in society yeah. where we want the younger set to kind of stay in a certain place while, you know, the status When you're is yeah. Coming. When you're young you notice so many things, you're so alert, you're so aware and after a while you get it all gets a bit too familiar and you sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. You get it is something that sort of comes up periodically as well because in genre pieces in film it's actually quite well known with things like horror films from the 80s, you know, Steven Spielberg was very good with it. It was un intuitive, intelligent children, and oblivious adults just sort of yeah, walking true. around doing, yeah. going about yeah. life. It was the kids who saw the ghosts and the demons sure. and they knew the real truth. Yes, that's because right. The adults were just bombing about yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. much the same throughout yeah, the film. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes they would learn from the children. Mm, mm. So it still does sort of come up mm, in culture. Mm. That's because Spielberg was making the films for that audience of those youngsters. If you look at ET, the yeah. camera is shot from the hip. So yeah. the camera is positioned at, at the child's, child's head height. The height of a ten year old throughout yeah. the whole of the film. Yeah, uh, absolutely it's, right. It's yeah. to yeah. appeal to a ten year old watching the film. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Maybe I should just mention a point as well, which is that um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was saying with that that um, in Hunter Gatherer Society and so many others, menstruation is a really um, powerful event. Um, very much celebrated with hunters and gatherers. It's treated as, a, as a, uh, sort of like the ultimate blessing. You've been blessed by the moon. Um, a, a very powerful, in, across Africa, hunter gatherers, it's the, the most powerful ritual that ever happens is around a girl's first menstruation. Um, and of course, in our culture, what happens? You know, I, you know, I mean, it's, it's just uh, most, so many girls don't even, haven't even been warned it's going to happen. They get terrified, you know, they're, they're at school or something and they start bleeding, they don't know what else is going on. And it's Im hugely embarrassing, um, very often, of course. Um, it's a, and it, it's a terrible thing, it seems to me. I've had, you know, I've met to my daughters and, and granddaughters as well, that nothing, nothing, nothing in our culture enables you to feel proud or and, and also to anticipate this event. Anyway, what I was going to say was about horror films. Because <laughs> with my daughter Olivia, um, I only found out th about this a little bit later. She said, Dad, we used to just, whenever, I, whenever you were out or our parents were out, what we would do was like a whole gaggle of us, eight or nine girls, we would all watch The Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> or some other film like that, and we'd all huddle together on a, on a settee, all clutching each other with these huge amounts of blood on the screen, absolute terror, but on the other hand, Dad, it meant that we trusted each other, we were confronting the fear, we were going through it, we were very, very brave, 
and it's like because the culture doesn't give you a, me a first menstruation ritual what it does give you is horror films <laughs> okay and you sort of have to make do with those horror films and uh, I don't know uh, whether that resonates with any of your experiences <laughs> yeah yeah cuddling your friends and when I was saying at, at Dark Moon you all this is what, what Ingrid was saying that, that we were all here singing in the dark the polyphonic singing and I know that when people in Africa hunter-gatherers do the polyphonic singing it's they're holding each other in terror of the lions and the leopards singing so it's a similar thing there's a, what's more frightening I mean you know we can have the chainsaw massacre the chainsaws are quite frightening but you know you don't have chainsaws in hunter-gatherer Africa you have but you have lions and they eat you and they, there's a lot of blood around so it's a similar thing everyone's hugging each other to keep safe and the, and the women even today the Bayaki women that Jerome and Ingrid work with when they're as I said then you say why are you singing all night long you don't have to sing all night long we're singing for our lives we have to keep 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 singing until the Sun comes up because we're not going to be safe so it's a similar idea of my, my daughter and her friends hugging each other on the city <laughs> Well, when the, the uh, okay, we, we didn't discuss that here, but it's fairly odd clear, isn't it? In this story, how many times do the sisters all go down into the underworld? Three. Just take a, a normal month. How often, how many times in a month is the moon absolutely not visible in the sky? Three. Okay, it's, it's a motif. The, 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 you know, the three visits to the underworld are clearly the three nights of the dark moon. It seems to me absolutely clear that that's it, and that's why that figure three is, is there so often. How many? Uh, I mean, you know, I won't go into Jesus and Christianity and stuff. I was brought up a Catholic. I've got huge admiration for Jesus. I'm sure he's a brilliant revolutionary liberation fighter against <laughs> Roman occupation of Palestine and you know all that stuff. But obviously, what happened afterwards was that it was all made a huge myth of, and instead of him being treated as a freedom fighter who. You know, I'm sure he didn't want particularly to be a sort of sacrifice or anything. I'm sure he wanted liberation for Israel. Um, but in the end it all went wrong. And then of course what happened was St. Paul and other people made a huge thing about him being a, a, a sacrifice. You know, he's like a lamb of God, like sacrifice, all that stuff. Anyway, what I'm simply saying is that when Jesus dies um, in the story, um, he dies for three nights. And it's his blood uh, which, is, which saves. So that, that three, you know, three nights of death before coming up back to life uh, 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 in the, with the resurrection at, uh, 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 on, on Sunday, having died on Friday. Uh, I'm just saying those, those motifs don't change. They, they survive even however many massive changes happen in the culture and the history and the religion. Those, uh, those basic m motifs seem to be almost time resistant. They seem to just survive um, of their own accord. Sorry? Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, as I say, um, I think all the world's magical myths and fairy tales, when you've listened to them a bit and made sense of them, you'll you'll find their versions of that story, where women originally had freedom and power, and then they lost it, and then when they lost it. Um, the world was like safe for marriage and the family in its patriarchal form um, and but the, the way in which the image of women's solidarity is first presented does change I mean here we've got these three sisters who jump into bed together but in other stories you know the, the image of that solidarity is very different here in the West we have these stories of the dragon um, the dragon is many-headed it's a many-headed dragon and the many-headed dragon has got an intimate connection with a young woman and uh, you, you have St George or some other patriarchal hero who, who wants to make that one that one who wants to, wants to sever that woman's connection with her with with, with everyone else so in, in my interpretation the dragon is an image of kinship solidarity blood solidarity that's why it's many-headed but patriarchy like you're saying wants to take a woman and cut her off from her connections her blood connection and make an isolated wife you are you're my wife um, I, I, I mean, we've had these stories recently, haven't we, about you know what happens uh, in I mean domestic violence and stuff. One woman gets killed every four days by her, her you know ex-husband or boyfriend every four days, and you just and you and you, when when these men are interviewed, 
and it, I mean it, was, it actually was last night I forget which one it was now he says that I knew when I saw you you are mine you're my wife my woman and as soon as a man starts saying you're mine I, I think your hair should stand on end <laughs> you should get incredibly worried because if he thinks he owns you uh, and then you you just have some little dance or flirt or something with somebody else he feels he's got the right to um, beat you up but I mean I'm, obviously that's the extreme end of it I'm not Anything that doesn't happen to him, he doesn't like. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Can we talk about the king then? Um, Let's talk about the king. <laughs> so the king, um, he, he can't deal with this himself. So he's he's just kind yeah. of alienated from the group of daughters. Yeah, so that's right. He has not hasn't a clue what they're up to. Some prince to come and sort it out. Yeah. But he's also mm. threatening the prince. Why? So, in a way, the, the <coughs> failure is, mm. is is has a penalty, um, and. So, you know, the success is is is, is rewarded with the, with one of the daughters. So. I, I, look, uh, when you say why, I mean I agree I've got to explain it and we have, we've got to explain it. But I mean to my to my mind it feels immensely satisfying that these these men once a month while the women have got power they have their heads chopped off. I don't know, maybe you don't find it satisfying, but it seems to be, <laughs> <laughs> seems to be a sort of just penalty for being, thinking you could just get a king's permission to take a woman. I mean, these women are very, very powerful. Um, and, um, the king is setting them up, isn't he? So yes. So he probably, yeah. you know, did he have to do this to become king? Does he oh, I see. secret already? Um, I, that, the, the interesting thing to me is he, he, this king hasn't a clue what his daughters are getting up to, has he? Not a clue. So he has to advertise for some distant prince to come along and find out by spying on them. And of course on his doorstep is this woman who yeah. could have told him yes. that ends up being a mentor of our soldier because our soldier showed him uh, respect. He spoke to her, you know. I suppose so, yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. in other words, don't ignore women. Don't ignore old don't women, especially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, she is a traitor to a to a gender, isn't she, that woman? I mean, if you if you think in those terms, you don't have to think in those terms. You can you can be totally in favour of patriarchal marriage. But I'm just saying, in the terms of the story, she's on the other side, isn't she? She's giving this this wounded soldier. She takes his side and, yeah. and offers to help him. Yeah, yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have we done enough with this story? Just one thing I would Go on. So yeah. In, in a way, when you think about um, your work in general, what you emphasize is, is the, the repetition of this cycle. Yeah. So what happens in, in the patriarchal myth is that, that it permanently goes over to, to the patriarchal thing. So in, in, a, in the hunter-gatherer myth or the rainbow snake, or whatever, all, that, all that stuff, Mm. Back so there's a cycle between the availability for marital sex, the, the, the lunar cycle, <coughs> and the social mm. cycle mm. keep going. Whereas in this situation, there's a kind of arrest. Of okay, the thank you, thank you, Anthony. Okay, maybe I should end with this. Okay, so w uh, here in Rag. I don't say we, because some of us have got slightly different theories, but I've got a theory, and Jerome has, and Camilla has, and many of us have got a theory that that the whole of human symbolic culture began with a kind of legislation around the subject of sex. So monkeys and apes, obviously they have sex, but they don't think they have like collectively agreed rules about sex. So a, a point was made a long time ago by an anthropologist, supposing there's a gorilla and he's got four or five females going around in his harem and one of them is his daughter, um, would all the other gorillas be outraged at the fact that the daughter's having sex, you know, the father's having sex with his daughter. I mean, the point is whether or not it happens is another issue. It may not happen actually with gorillas. But the point is that if, if it did happen, there wouldn't be a collective moral outrage. You know, chimpanzees don't really do that and gorillas don't really do that. So at the root of all the world's religions, there's something in my view, I'm not, I'm not, I was brought up a Catholic, but I'm definitely an atheist these days. Um, but there's something wonderful about all the world's religions, and this is this wonderful idea, which is that some things are sacred. To me that is quite important. Um, especially when you think about our society today, when pretty much nothing is sacred, everything's got some kind of price. Um, but anyway, the world's religions make it very clear, some things are sacred, and ultimately, um, if the body is not sacred, kind of nothing is. And women especially need that rule that the body is sacred. I'm not saying men don't need it, but the thing about men is, you know, in general, obviously not always, men have got an option of violence which is more of an option than women have got. 
Um, if, if, if violence is a game, women with babies really aren't likely to win that game too often, whereas men are more likely to win it. So there's a special need to declare our bodies are sacred, where women are concerned, and children, of course, which, which means kind of a rule against violence. So we have the theory that all of this began, the whole of sexual morality began when women, um, all kinds of reasons behind it, I won't go into it, that's not the, the place for it now, we've just got a very <laughs> brief evening on this, but when women f found a way to establish no means no, our bodies are selves, when we indicate no sex, that means no sex. And, and the argument is that this happened once a month, coinciding with menstruation, so that menstrual blood was the sign of the sacredness of the body. So that being, your flesh covered in blood means don't touch, don't come near, sacred. So that happens at Dark Moon. <coughs> Time is very simply divided, so we have a pulse, and these, these myths reflect that pulse. What Anthony was just saying was that this story has a pulse, which ends, the pulse ends, it ends with a fixed state, but, but originally there was a pulse, and the, and the moon was the clock. Um, so women would synchronize their menstrual cycles with the moon, using rituals to do that, having a, a kind of what we might call a sex strike at dark moon, it's displayed by menstruation, and the, that period of being set apart in, in sacred time, if you like, ritual time, would last for half the month, from dark moon to full moon. And then at full moon, the taboos are lifted, the spells are lifted, and flesh becomes available. And full moon means honeymoon, it means romance, it means, you know, that sex has come together and have sex, and also it means that the meat from the hunt can be cooked and enjoyed and feasted on. And so we get through waning moon, we have a period of consumption and enjoyment, including marital sex. Down until next dark moon, the blood flows and, and creates an, this new period of ritual power or, or you know, gender segregation. So there's so the, the, in the stories, this, it, this t t takes a certain form. It takes the form of, okay, this world, which is the world where you consume, where you can see individuals, where you're not all in the compact mass, where you have marital sex, where you have f food. So this is this world. And then at Dark Moon, everything switches into the other world. And the other world is a kind of death, in the sense that it's a death to this world. So nobody's, in the other world, nobody's a wife, nobody's a husband, everyone's a sister, everyone's a brother. So you have a different kind of intimacy, which is not marital intimacy. So as the moon waxes and wanes, you have a movement between this world, the other world, this world, the other world. Every woman becomes, is, a, is a wife, and then a sister, the wife, then a sister. Every man's a husband, and then a brother, husband, and then a brother. You move between those worlds. And the world of kinship and the world of marriage are as far apart um, as the earth is from the sky. And there's, all these stories reflect that, that, if you like, rule by the moon. There's movement to and fro, to and fro. When you die, but you, you don't die permanently. You just die for two weeks, and then you come alive again. So temporary death followed by resurrection is, of course, is what the moon does, but the argument is that people weren't just looking at the moon and thinking, oh, it dies and it gets reborn. People were living with the moon and going through a kind of death and a resurrection, a death and a, a, a resurrection as a normal process of life. Um, so when levi says that all the world's myths are variations on a theme, I think he's right. I don't think he quite got the, to the root of it all because he had a strange theory about the origin of incest. He thought men invented it the incest taboo, and he thought men invented menstrual taboos, and men invented cooking rules, and men invented everything. But because the stories kind of say that, the stories more or less say that originally there was chaos because women were ruling the world, and then men sorted the women out, and then we had proper <laughs> law and order. Yeah, it's very interesting <laughs> that the king is the one who's bewildered. Yes. And it's the, the women, the group of sisters, the old woman, the older yeah. sister, that mm. determine everything. Yeah. So that the story wouldn't actually happen without those cues. No. So uh, I think the other thing you could emphasize is how on your kind of version of the one myth is that, that sexual morality, sexuality itself, and fertility are all determined by women's solidarity mm. and not by the, yeah, the yeah, king. Yeah, yeah. Um, under patriarchy, you have the opposite, where what, what is called sexual morality actually consists in the repression of female sexuality yeah. Control of female mm, 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 mm. Okay, I think we'll, we'll stop in a moment because I wouldn't mind going to the pub and having a drink. But just just to say this, because uh, the last bit, 
um, some people think that what happened in the past is like in the past and we'll never really know about the past and, and many anthropologists think that, they think it's a bit of guesswork to work out how we became human, what was happening in Africa 100,000 years ago uh, and, and all that stuff. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware that it's difficult to work out what happened in the past but I would say that if we can't use the clues which are available to reconstruct our past it's kind of our problem and it doesn't mean that the past doesn't live on through those clues into the present. I mean after all when you think about it, uh, physicists, astronomers, we've now worked out what happened in the first nanoseconds after the Big Bang of the origin of the universe and the theories are quite good actually. They, they, when they're tested it turns out that they, they really work. We've, so we've managed to go back f 14 and a half billion years to the origin of the very universe. Uh, if we can do that I don't see why we can't go back three or four hundred thousand years in Africa to the time when our species became symbolic. I think we should. And one of the arguments which Levi-Strauss makes is that all the world's myths and fairy tales are kind of echoes of that moment when we, f when we move from being non-symbolic to becoming symbolic. Actually Levi-Strauss has two basic theories, one of which I don't think is so good. He, s he, s he says one of them is that the, the myths, ref if you ask why do these myths have this underlying common structure, he said it's just the genetic architecture of the human brain which is designed like a digital computer with these on-off switches like life, death, kinship, marriage, war, cooked and stuff. But he also has the other theory which I just mentioned which is that actually these stories may, they're, the, they're, the, they're a kind of anonymous voice going right, 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 right back to the moment when we first became culturally and symbolically and linguistically human. And I prefer that theory. I don't think the human brain is a digital computer in any sense whatsoever. But I do think the moon was constructed by humans as kind of digital in the sense that it's either waxing or waning, waxing or waning, off, on, off, on, in terms of the switching on or off of ritual power. But, and, but what these stories show is that there was an initial time when we, we were able to die and come alive again, die and come alive again, die and come alive again. Death as a permanent feature, as like you're dead, you die and you stay dead, was the result of some horrible mistake. And if you look at the stories which explain the origin of death, Aboriginal Australian stories, African stories, Amazonian stories, it's invariably some story about um, a go-between. It could be the hare, it could be some, some, some bird. But the go-between made a mistake. It got a message. The moon was basically saying, you humans, you want, to do, you want to die like I do. You want to die and then come alive again. Die and come alive again. And the hare takes this message to the humans and kind of gets it wrong. So, and then as a result of that terrible mistake, that breakdown in communication between humans and the moon, now when we die, it's very sad, and it's true, we stay dead.